Sunday school classes. I want to take just a moment to mention our Bible, our adult Bible classes. Today was my first day uh, starting a new class, and uh, I had uh, I had everybody in the class was a visitor because we were it was a new class. But anyway, we had a lot of visitors. But um, my class, we start out with uh, today with just question and answer. We probably spent 30 or 40 minutes just talking question and answer, and then we started in the the book of Deuteronomy. But what I want to do is just take a moment and introduce the teachers of our classes. Uh, in case you aren't in an adult class. So uh, my class meets uh, straight up here in the Sunday School building. My, it's the last class this direction toward the street, and uh, there's some signs up there. But uh, So our other classes, let's see, my wife, why don't, if you're an adult teacher, why don't you stand up? I see Ken there. My wife is over here, Mrs. Goddard. She has a ladies' class. All of our classes, oh, not all, most of them are up there. So stay standing. Uh, you can clap for all of them in a minute. So my wife's cl class is all ladies. Um, back in the back, Wes Morgan, raise your hand there, Brother Morgan. He, uh, his class is in our Sunday school building. The Greg Beal here, he's our school principal. He teaches in here. Back, Dave Matuzak, raise your hand there, Mr. Dave. He was up here a minute ago. His class is right here. So those two adult classes are in this room. The others are all up in the building. Brother Dexter's got the Filipino class. And back in the back, Ken Peterson's class is up here. Uh, uh, Caleb Beal is out of town. But uh, Caleb is a young adult class uh, there in that building, and I'm missing C. Who am I missing? Oh, the Spanish. We have a Spanish class if you're bilingual, but half of you are Spanish and English speaking, so you can stay here. Is that everybody? I should have planned this ahead. So anyway, thank you, adult teacher. If you don't go to an adult Bible class, I'd encourage you to go for the food and the fellowship and for the lessons. All right, give those teachers a hand. So those classes are at... Uh, nine o'clock, nine o'clock, and some start at nine, some start later, depending on how much food there is. But anyway, uh, I made the coffee in my class. No one commented good or bad. If you didn't like the coffee in my class, then you make it next week, and that'll be good, because I don't drink coffee. Uh, I don't do that. Matthew 24 in your Bible, if you'd look with me. And again, these, uh, there's a lot of, of good reason to gather together in fellowship and to get to know other of God's people. And uh, the lessons, our adult lessons are not all the same. We have uh, lessons, uh, but everybody kind of modifies and teaches what they want. Uh, I trust our adult teachers. So Matthew chapter 24, look down at verse 34. Now we're going to use our Bibles quite a bit today. And, um, and uh, uh, Brother Ken, make, have, they could stay in the foyer or something. If they, she doesn't need to leave, okay, or the overflow room. Make sure our guests are comfortable. Uh, let's stand together. We're going to read a couple verses, Matthew 24, 34. Matthew 24. I've been teaching, preaching on the second coming of Christ. It's Matthew 24. Look at verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, plural words. He's talking about the individual words. My words shall not pass away. Verse 36 but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And let's pray. Help us today, Lord. Teach us as we consider your return. And may we be aware, may we be conscious, and most of all, may we be prepared. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. We're going to look at our Bibles a couple of First, starting in Matthew 24. And I encourage you, bring a Bible to church. Look at it. Get familiar with your Bible. Mark it up. Read it. Study it. Matthew chapter 24. Now, basically, Matthew 24, the whole chapter is about end times. And again, if you've been here the last few weeks, um, give you just a, a quick uh, rundown. If here's where we are today, the Bible used the term the last days, the end days, the great tribulation. There's a bunch of words of the second coming, his return. There's little phrases. They all indicate a time in the, in the future. Here's where we are today. At some point, a trumpet's going to sound, catch us away up into heaven. And there are the last days, end of time, all these phrases. And it's very broad. Some of it has to do with when we're caught away. Some of it has to do with this time of great tribulation. Some of it has to do with Christ's return to earth with you and me. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about us returning on horses, riding back with Jesus. Then there, he sets up a 1,000, a millennial, milla, mil, a thousand, a millennial reign of Christ, a thousand years on earth, and then a final judgment, and then 
the uh, dead are raised out of hell and their judge cast into an eternal lake of fire and then the eternal kingdom. So this, there's a lot of, when you read about the last days or in time, it could be anywhere in there. So let me just say uh, for simplicity, Matthew 24 is all about that. Are you okay with that? It's all about that. It's not about you and me now. It's all about that. All right, now, I want you to notice, though, chapter 24, verse 34, Matthew 24, 34, where we read a moment ago. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now, um, this, uh, well, this generation shall not pass. This generation, he's talking, if you'll trust me with this, because this is not the sermon, he's talking about the generation when when Israel becomes a nation, if you go back up just a few verses to uh, uh, verse 32, the parable of the fig tree, when the branch is yet tender, put it forth its leaves, you know, summer's nigh. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the door, this generation. Now he's talking about, if you'll trust me on this, that the nation of Israel becoming a nation again. That was 1948. And he says, this generation shall not pass until all these things take place. So you can name a generation, you can do multiple calendars, whatever you want to do. But 1948 was the beginning of the end. And, um, and I'm not predicting a date or anything, but we are looking at in this chapter things that, that spring off of the nation of Israel becoming a nation again from the time Titus of Rome conquered Jerusalem uh, in the first century all the way till 1948 we were a people with really uh, the Jewish people had no home they were scattered all over the world and so uh, in 1948 they were official uh, back in 1910 1909 there was a beginning but was it 1948 till they were recognized? So this generation, so if a generation's 100 years, which I don't think it is, but if it was, 1948 plus 100 years would be what? Come on, it's not a hard math problem. 2048, right? And we're here at 2021. But most people don't think a generation's 100 years. Most people think it's less. If a generation was 80 years, Boy, now we're going to have to do hard math. 2048 minus 20 would be 2028. All right? But if it was three score and 10, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> we're out of here any day. Now, and by the way, you that are young and looking forward to getting married, those of us that are old, we don't care. <laughs> All right. Hey, look, if you want a partial rapture, talk to God about it. But us older people, we are ready to go. You want to hang out for another decade, go for it. But we are ready to go. Now, I want you to notice some things about this chapter. And this morning, uh, I'm going to talk about one minute. One minute. It's my message. One minute after you die. But um, he says in verse uh, thirty. 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, people have used that verse to say, nobody knows, it could be any time. But you know what this whole chapter is? Science. The whole chapter. Go back to verse 1 and verse 2 of chapter 24. I'm sorry, verse 3. They're on the Mount of Olives in verse 3, Gen Matthew 24, verse 3. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of... What shall be the what? Sign. sign. What will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Notice, even the disciples differentiate between his coming and the end. It's a time period there. And verse 4, and Jesus answered and said unto them, and he began for the next 30 verses to tell them things. This is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. 
And then he goes down to verse 36, but of the day and the hour knoweth no man. So we don't know if it's tomorrow or the next day, but could you at least trust me? It's really close. Uh, the Lord is coming again, and uh, he is going to come. And the first thing that most of us believe, like Curtis Hudson said, when the trumpet sounds, all those that are pre-tribulational will be caught up in the clouds. All those who are mid-trib and post-trib will become pre-tribulational. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to fuss about it because when the trumpet sounds, we'll get her all figured out, okay? But it is, it is understood Christ is coming again. And, and I'm not going to go through a lot of these things, but one thing, he gives us a time period sign. This generation shall not pass away until he comes, till all these things are fulfilled. And he goes back here and talks about wars and rumors of war and, and uh, turmoil among people. So Matthew 24 is all geared about our Lord's return. So I just say to you that are 14, you're probably not going to see your 21st birthday. It's great. They're not excited. They don't know what's coming. They'll be plenty excited. Now, I'd like you to look with me at several passages of Scripture. Now, mark Matthew, because we're going to come back here at the end. But I want to go through several. First, we're going to look at the book of James. Almost to the book of Revelation, right at the end of your Bible, the book of James, chapter 2. Now, hold that, James, chapter 2. Let me just say several things before we get to James. Number one, it is imperative it is absolutely essential you get saved it's urgent it is it is beyond urgent it is life or death eternal life or eternal death you need to know that you're saved and in a group this is not a giant group of people but in a group of people this size the odds of everyone in this room having trusted Christ is very small. Almost for sure there are people in this room who are good people, religious people. You're in a uh, old-fashioned Baptist church that sings hymns. Somebody the other day said, I just love the church because it sings hymns. I was thinking they're going to say they love the church because of the preaching. <laughs> it's not about me. It's about the hymnal. But you know what? This I'll take this second to this. They're both real close. And I'm not going to a church without these, just so you know. If you're waiting for us to, to get a, a rock band and a praise team and, and get rid of our hymn, though, you're going to have to shoot me first. By the way, I'll hold still. Get a good... <laughs> don't try to get me on my bicycle or something, all right? Just tell me stop. I'll stop. Get a good shot, and I'm on my way out of here. But uh, it is so urgent that you get saved because you don't know you have another breath it is so and, and you know people say well i'm not worried about it have an asthma attack and see how you're worried i don't know that i have any asthma but i remember my wife would tell you i was in bed one night and just out of the clear blue my something here closed up i mean just literally i could not get a breath and i was awake instantly and standing up, and there was no air going in, going out. I was absolutely going to suffocate right there. And so I grabbed the phone, and I handed it to her to dial 911. Now, my wife, she's very tender, very compassionate. She looked at me, and she said, are you sure? <laughs> so if you ever see that brown, bruised-looking mark on her head, that's what, that's what I did with the phone. <laughs> And she was right. She usually is. Only the last 40 years she's been right. Uh, today's our 40th anniversary. So for 40 years she's been right. She's got the right guy for 40 years. Amen. But anyway. Well, I, um, and we've got a lot of people beyond 40 in this room. Okay. But I do appreciate it. But, but, uh, but you know what? You try getting yourself at a spot near death. And suddenly life is very precious. Very precious. And uh, I don't know what, you know, these silly things, you know, I come read my story. I was in heaven, talked to Jesus, came back. Let me tell you, no, he's, he's a liar. He had too much pizza and beer. Um, I, I have no idea. But I do know this. 
one minute, one minute, I could say five seconds, but one minute's easier to, to calculate here. One minute after you stop breathing this air, your world will change. One minute. One minute after you leave this earth, you're not going to care what kind of phone you had. Brother Joel Paul back there, his phone is so old, the phone company sent him a note and said, we can no longer service your phone. <laughs> he got his from Spock. <laughs> but you know what? One minute after you stop breathing earthly air, you will not care what kind of car you drove. One minute after you leave this earth physically, spiritually, one minute after your death, you won't care about what position you had. Whether you were a CEO, a president, whether you were a millionaire or homeless, you will not care, not one little bit, one minute in hell, and you will trade everything that you ever owned in your whole life for one minute out of hell. One minute in heaven, and you'll have forgotten any tear, any heartache, any loneliness. You'll forget the grief at a funeral, and you'll forget the grief at the loss of loved ones. You'll forget about that layoff. One minute in heaven, and you, you won't even remember you got laid off. You won't even remember you had a job. You won't even remember you had a mother-in-law. All those memories will be gone. One one minute in heaven, one minute in heaven, and you'll forget anything that you thought was important on earth. You know, you know the things that right now we I just have to do this. Have you ever noticed how many things that are very urgently important that God doesn't do? Right? I mean, have you not gone to God passionately, urgently, and have him ignore it totally? If not, you need to get saved. I don't know how many times I've gone to God. I believe, I trust, I'm holding out, I'm fasting. I've claimed all 23 prayer promises in the New Testament, and God totally ignores it because he completely knows what's best. And I'll tell you, that song, one glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. You get in heaven one minute, you won't care whether you had hair or not. You won't care whether you have the uh, furniture disease. You know, as you get older, your chest drops into your drawers. <laughs> None of that will matter. Not going to matter at all. You won't care that you wore glasses or you wore contacts or you had the money to have a uh, uh, laser, whatever. Oop, let somebody put a laser in their eye. Unbelievable. One minute after death, you'll have forgotten any desire for earthly security. You know what? We just have to have this money in our pension and we have to have these retirements and we have to have this. One minute in heaven, you won't care. And I'm not against those things. I'm just going to tell you, it won't matter. It won't matter. I'll, I'll go a step further. You won't care whether you can do a push-up or a chin-up. <laughs> Tuesday, I was down visiting Brother Mrs. Gallardo in San Diego and and we're horsing, just talking. I was goofing off with the kids, and they've got a rings and a chin-up bar, and, and uh, Silas there. Well, how old is Silas? He's 10, 9, 6. He's little. He's, uh, he gets, he says, want to see me do chin-ups? I said, yeah, if I weigh as much as you, I can do chin-ups. <laughs> you know, he's it's like two bags of flour or something and nothing to him a loaf of bread with with arms attached little guy you know I got an old an old dead cow attached to my arms <laughs> I can roll over and play dead <laughs> one minute one minute off this earth you won't care that you had chemotherapy one minute you won't care not a bit whether you live to be 60 or 110 it won't matter in fact one minute in heaven and you might regret having lived a long time somebody was interviewing this lady uh, that was a hundred and whatever years old and they said how's it feel she said it feels terrible <laughs> do you, you think when you get to heaven you're gonna be walking around bragging 
that you'd live to be 85 or 95. You think anyone's even going to care? You're going to walk by Methuselah. <laughs> who lived 960 years. You're going to walk by Stephen who in his youth preached his first sermon and was killed. And he'll be one of the great heroes in heaven. If our only claim to fame is we live to be 80 or we live to retire and have a good pension, if that's the claim to fame on earth, heaven is going to be really empty. And you're going to walk around heaven and see John Patton, whose first visit to Vanuatu, his wife died and his baby died. And he had to run and hide for his life and for days and weeks and finally gets off the island. There's a ship comes by, he gets out to that ship and gets the ship back home and Heart's broken. Goes to the mission board, the people that had sent him there. And of course, you'd expect tenderness and kindness. Young man, early 20s, wife dead, baby dead, barely escaped with his life. And the mission board director says, had you stayed there and died, you'd have been a martyr. And so much money would have poured into the mission board from compassionate church members. But since you came home, you're a quitter. And no one wants to support a quitter. Well, at that point, I'd have quit the ministry. John Patton went church to church telling about the ministry and the need of the people in the Vanuatu. And a couple of years later, he's married and back on another island. And every single person on that island got saved. And you think when you get to heaven, you're going to be glad you drove a Lexus? Or a Tesla. Now, I'm not against Lexus and Tesla. I, I heard they're having a, I like trucks, so I think I've heard that Tesla's going to have a truck. So, anyway, you know, I'm going to have a birthday next year. But. <laughs> I started figuring out how much gas costs to fill up my truck and guessed what a Tesla truck would cost. I could fill up my truck the rest of my life before I paid for a Tesla truck with fuel costs. But anyway, Ian James. James chapter, you thought I forgot. James chapter 2. There are people on this earth that will say, I am going to heaven because I believe in God. James 2, look down at verse 19. James 2 and verse 19. James 2, 19. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. You know what James says? You believe in God, so What? You know, you go knocking on doors. Hi, I'm from Faith Baptist Church. Can I talk to you about it? You know, whatever church, heaven, hell, whatever. Oh, well, I believe in God. I'm fine. Oh, yeah, the devil believes in God. Hey, believing in God is not getting you into heaven. Believing in God only proves that you have a brain. Because anybody with any intelligence at all knows there is definitely a God. The heavens declare the glory of God. Anybody with any honesty in their soul, unless you've been to a university, you know there's a God. Uh, I was at a secular college as a freshman in a sociology class, and the sociology teacher said, there are several things that are universal. Every country, every people group, the most primitive to the most modern, every group of people on the entire planet no, there's a good God and an evil God, and they all believe in the reward for good and the punishment for evil. As an unsaved professor in a university, everybody knows that. You believe there's one God? You could paraphrase it to our vernacular, so what? You get witnessing to people, talking to them a little bit, and some people say, well, you know, I've, I've done a lot of good things. Oh, really? Look over, you, you saved Matthew, right? Look at Matthew 7. Look at Matthew chapter 7. If you didn't save Matthew, it's your own fault. I told you to. Matthew chapter 7. There are people, uh, I've asked people, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Oh, yeah, you know what? I, I've been, uh, I'm generous. I treat my neighbor right. Never have stolen. Never been to jail. Don't drink. Don't smoke. Oh, that's really awesome. Matthew chapter 7. You there yet? Matthew 7, look at verse 22. Matthew 7, 22, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in that name? Oh, this guy said, of course I'm going to heaven. I'm a preacher. In thy name we've cast out de devils. We are exorcists. 
You want to know if I'm going to heaven? Bring me a demon. I'll cast it out. And in thy name, they're telling Jesus, in thy name done many wonderful works, verse 23, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now there's a key phrase there, you'll notice, I never knew you. Jesus is not nearly as worried about what you've done as who you know and who he knows. It's not about whether you're good or not. The fact is, the majority of you, your rating of good versus evil is pretty good if we compare you to Stalin or Hitler or Mussolini. The fact is, I would guess most of you pay your bills and most of you treat people right throughout the week unless they deserve other treatment. <laughs> most of you are nice to your parents, your spouse, your in-laws. But you know what Jesus said? I don't care if you preach. I don't care if you cast out devils. I don't care... I don't even know who you are. The question this morning is not just do you know him, does he know you? If our president were to walk past me on the street, I would probably recognize him by the Sinai dog, the wheelchair. <laughs> I could say the past four or five presidents I would recognize in a store. I know them question is do they know me now several of them I could not care less but you ought to care whether Jesus knows you or not so we're looking at here the fact that you believe in God it's not going to get you into heaven now the message I am on the second coming again today but I want you to understand he is coming and we don't know when we don't know the day or the hour, but he gave us all of Matthew 24, the signs. And I've, the last few weeks I've been talking about this. There are things he's lined up. He's coming soon, taking the generation from 1948 to, to today. A 70-year generation, is a, we're close. An 80-year generation, we're still close. Even a 100-year generation, that would not be far away. Uh, just a few years. Our Lord is returning, so I want to challenge you. You need to know you're saved. You need to know you're going to face God one day. Now, as a child of God, I'll get to you in a minute. We need to understand we will also see the returning Christ, and we will be rewarded for our service of him. Now, not whether we go to heaven or hell, but we'll be rewarded for our works. Some people say, you know, I'm, I'm going to heaven. Look, look over a couple pages to the book of Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Some people just say, you know, I'm Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 18. Many, many people... For the last 45 years, I've been witnessing to people, opening a New Testament up or a gospel track. And first person I led to Christ, I got saved in, in August. And sometime during that school semester, uh, there was a young lady that was in my ceramics class right next to me. And the wheel, you know, a wheel, a ceramics wheel, the wheel right next to me. You say, why were you in a university taking a ceramics class? Because I was on an athletic scholarship. It's the safest way to keep your grade point high. <laughs> uh, I went in for registration on the first day of class, but this back when you registered on paper. Some of you don't even know what paper is, but um, signed up for all my classes. My counselor, my college counselor, was my coach. So, you know, you walk through line after line. I go over to him and lay my my uh, class schedule down and. He pulls out his pen, lines through that, lines through that, lines through that, and he writes in. What he, I didn't know it. I was a freshman. What did I know? He was writing down the easiest classes in the college. <laughs> he didn't care about me getting a diploma. He cared about me keeping my grade point up so I could play on the ball team. <laughs> so I'm in ceramics class. Back to the story. <laughs> this girl next to me, we get talking about, the, and I was a brand new Christian. I'd, I'd not been even baptized yet. I'd I'd not even been to church since I got saved, but I was reading my Bible every day, and I got talking to her about the Bible, and she said, oh, I go to the, she didn't talk about Bible she'd read, because she was going to an Episcopalian church. Now, I didn't know what Episcopalian was, but a word that big, I didn't like it. <laughs> if, if I can't spell or pronounce your religion, it's not right. <laughs> you know, Baptist, B-A-B-T-I-S. <laughs> it's not hard, I can be a Baptist. <laughs> But uh, that's not how you spell it, okay? Our public school graduates here. But 
Every day in class, however many hours a week we had ceramics, I don't remember. But finally one day after class, she bowed her head and trusted Christ. And you know, it's really funny. Um, she got saved and, and she said, you know what, now that I'm saved, you ought to go to church with me. Now, I wasn't smart enough to say, why would I go to your church that didn't even tell you how to get to heaven? But she was single and cute, and I was single and cute. And, and you talk about a scary church. It's this really high, pointy thing and stained glass, and it's dark. And these guys come down, the, and it was really quiet. No one said anything. And there's these uh, spooky, like, Dracula organs playing. And these guys come down, I think guys, I don't know, these, these things come down the center aisle with pointed hats and long robes, swinging incense pots. You ever hear of incense pots? It's a real thing. I didn't know that was a real thing. I thought it's only what they did in the exorcist to get the <laughs> demons out or whatever. And they're... <laughs> and I looked at her and I thought, man, we better just get back to Jesus, girl. My Bible and salvation <laughs> never went back there to her Episcopalian church. You know, she'd had all kinds of religion, but she didn't have any Jesus. Look with me at Luke chapter 18, if you would, and a very brief story here. Uh, if you look at um, Luke 18, verse 10, Luke 18, verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, that's a very religious man. The other a publican. That was a very crooked and corrupt man, a bad man. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus, and I love this next two words, with himself. Nobody was listening. It was just him. Played, prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. He's looking around church saying, what is that guy doing here? Verse 12, I fast twice in the week. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I'm willing to say not many people in this room fast twice a week, unless it's between when you go to bed and when you get up. <laughs> I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. This was a man who was very religious and very good. But over next to him is the publican. If you look there at the next verse, We've got the publican in verse 13, standing afar off would not so much as lift up his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Over here, this publican, he wouldn't even look up. He just looked down and said, oh, God, be merciful to me. And the next verse, Jesus says, he went to his house justified rather than that guy. This guy went to church. This guy prayed. This guy gave money. This guy was very careful with his behavior, but good works don't take care of a sin problem. Only Jesus takes care of a sin problem. And the fact is, your sin will send you to hell. See, I'm very religious. You can go to hell religious. Well, I've been baptized. You can go to hell. You'll sizzle for a while before the water gets boiled off. Uh, yeah, I was a preacher. I cast out devils. Okay, there's going to be plenty of work for you in hell in your new home. But you're not going to heaven because you were a preacher or because you went to church or because you were good. No way at all. You, did you lose Matthew yet? Go back over to Matthew 8. I should have done this. I love this story. Matthew chapter 8. We'll stay in Matthew, all right? Unless we go back to James. Matthew chapter 8. A lot of boys and girls in our Sunday school up in our Sunday school rooms, they know how to get to heaven. And a lot of adults have no idea. Because you say to a little boy or a little girl, you understand you're a sinner? They'll usually say yes. You say to an adult, you understand you're a sinner? Well, how would you define the word sinner? You know, there's a lot of semantics in this thing. No, you're a sinner and you're lost and you're on your way to hell. My wife, she's taught Sunday school since we got here, and uh, I don't know how many grades. She was teaching little children, and um, she told me after church's day, it's so funny, a whole bunch of little boys and girls in class, and she said, uh, you know, the Bible says we're all sinners. Now, do you understand we're all sinners? Oh, yeah. How many of you, you know you're a sinner? Raise your hand. And this one little boy wouldn't raise his hand. He said, I'm not a sinner. And she said, oh, that's too bad. 
because Jesus only died for sinners. And he said, well, maybe I've sinned. <laughs> I guess I have sinned. Oh, look at Matthew. If you're there, Matthew chapter 8. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west. That's you and me. And shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom, that's the Jewish people, shall be cast into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, it doesn't matter what your ethnic background is. It doesn't matter whether you're Russian, German, Polish. Uh, doesn't matter at all. You're Swedish, you said. And my family's got Norwegian, half Norwegian and half mutt. And uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you're from. It matters, do you know you're a sinner? It, the, the big issue. Jesus is trying to explain to these religious people. You see, the Jewish people in the New Testament, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, because Matthew was written to present Jesus as king of the Jews. The parables were so specific to Jews and to the eternal kingdom. And, um, and these Jews were so arrogant that they thought they were the only ones. Remember in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius' house, Peter had a problem believing that a, that a Gentile like Cornelius could get saved. Those Jews, half of the book of Acts, all the way up to Acts chapter 10 and further, Acts chapter 12 actually, either on Wednesday nights we're studying the book of Acts. Come, you'll learn some things. But, um, but you have to get all the way to Acts 12. In Acts chapter 12, the church in Jerusalem with the apostles, they're talking about whether or not you can get saved without the law. Still in Acts chapter 12. Well, do you have to be, do you have to take this? Do you have to do that? Do you have to keep that commandment? And the, Acts chapter 12, these Jews were so arrogant. By the way, a lot of Americans are arrogant. You know, God cares about us, but I don't know if he cares about those people. Let me tell you, those people, if they're in the world, he cares about those people. He does care. And you may today wonder if he cares about you, but I can assure you he cares. And Jesus says in Matthew 8 to these arrogant people who are so trusting that they were going to heaven simply because they were Jewish. Remember, remember what Jesus said when the triumphal entry? The, uh, the Pharisees, the people are crying out, Hosanna and glory to God in the highest. And Jesus is coming in. And the Pharisees said, stop them. Don't you hear what they're saying? And remember what he said? If they stopped, the stones would cry out. Another place Jesus said to the Pharisees, don't say because you're a Jew or a child of Abraham, you think you're good. God could raise up a child of Abraham from a rock. You know, you know what he, he was saying? You're not that special compared to everybody else. We're all sinners. We're all sinners. By the way, Baptists are sinners. You know, you've heard jokes. Um, somebody walking around heaven and says, now don't go over to that part of heaven. Why not? Because where the Baptists are, they think they're the only ones that made it. <laughs> now we are the only ones that are right. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh man, you know what? There's only one universal truth. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. There's a lot to build on top of that. Go back a couple of pages to Matthew chapter 5. Now, all this has to do with Christ's return because you're going to see him. You're going to see him. I've used the illustration. You're old Matthew 5. I've used the illustration before. My, my mom and dad, when I was little, they rode to work together. They'd get home, and I want to say it was 5.30, but whatever time it was, irrelevant. They'd get home every night about the same time. My brother and I'd get home. We'd have certain duties. We'd have to do chores around the house. And we'd watch Gilligan's Island in combat and whatever I Love Lucy was on. And, and, uh, but we'd watch the clock because the work had to be done by the time Mom and Dad got home. And uh, as the clock got closer, we'd hurry. You know, during the commercials, you'd run in. You know, my brother would wash during one commercial. The next commercial, I'd dry and doing the dishes or whatever. And, and, uh, but when it got close to time, forget the TV. They're coming again. We don't know exactly what minute they're coming, but when they walk in that door, we better be ready for them. But I tell you, Jesus is coming again. And you better be ready for him. 
You need to get saved, or when he comes, you're in big, big trouble. If you are saved, you need to understand that the fact that he saved you, forgave all your sin, you will then face the judgment seat of Christ. Not whether you go to heaven or hell, because you're already in heaven. But it's your rewards for eternity. Forever, that's what eternity is. Matthew chapter 5, look down at verse 20. Matthew 5, verse 20, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's pretty blunt. The Pharisees and the scribes were very rigid. Go over to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Jesus made it clear. You, you guys, you're not very good, and you've got to be really, really good. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18 and verse 3, and Jesus uh, and, and said, Verily I send you, except you be converted. Notice he doesn't say except you be good. He doesn't say except you become a Baptist or except you be baptized. In verse 3 of chapter 18, and except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now let's explain it. Over here on this side, we've got all the very educated, wise, mature adults and we all think we've got this religious thing figured out. Over here is all the kids up in the Sunday school building. And those little children, you go to them and say, Jesus loves you. And they'll say, yeah, that's nice. Go to those little children, tell them that Jesus made heaven for them. Oh, I'm glad. And he loved, and they'll sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible. Tell, and they'll, you know what? A child has no problem believing that Jesus is coming again. That there's a city that's going to come floating down from God out of heaven. That Jesus died for their sins. And if you'd be willing to trust Jesus, Jesus will pay your way so you can go into heaven. And those kids, they're such simple in their hearts, so simple in their faith. And then the adults over here, you know what we'll say? We'll say, well, you know what, we need to keep our children, well, let our children wait till they're older and mature to make a decision. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, we adults need to become like them. Look back at that verse again. Verse 3, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Unless we are willing to stop our arrogant intellectualism, stop our, well, I'm just not really sure, did he really create the heavens and the earth? Was it seven days or six days? And, and I, I mean, could it have been eons and did Adam have a belly button? And where did Cain get his wife? And all these intellectual questions. You've never thought about that, right? <laughs> and God says, you better learn from those children that Jesus loves you and just accept him. Go over a page to Matthew 19. Matthew chapter 19, one page over or so in your Bibles. Look down to verse 23. Matthew 19, they, of course, like most people, associate wealth with goodness. You know, most people that got rich didn't get rich being good. Matthew 19, look at verse 23. Jesus said to his disciples, Verily I say unto you, the rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now we need to understand the day that you're not going to get into heaven because you're religious, because you're good, or because you good, do good deeds. You're going to get to heaven because you became like a little child and trusted Christ. Now, these weeks we've been talking about the second coming. We're, we're near it. Now, I have no idea when. I don't have any idea. I don't know the day or the hour, but Thessalonians we read already a couple three weeks ago, that that day should not overtake you as a thief. You and I, when the trumpet sounds and the dead rise incorruptible, those of us that are alive and remain, we ought to say, hey, it's happening. Or maybe we'll just say, ah. as the graves pop open and zombie apocalypse starts. We're, we're not going to look scared. It's, it's like getting a shot. The doctor says, this will hurt a little. That's a lie. Doctors are such liars. You know, the dentist comes with a nine-inch needle. 
and he, you know, and then it goes all the way through your mouth. But um, this will hurt a little. Oh, it's going to hurt a lot. I know it's coming, but it doesn't mean I'm not shocked by it, but I do know it's coming. I know the Lord's return is near, and you and I are going to face him. Now, if you're saved, you're going to face him with joy and rejoicing, the Savior who loved you, the Savior you love. You ever wonder what language we're going to talk? We all think we're going to talk English or whatever. You know, Brother Valdez tells us Spanish is the heavenly language. And um, we all think our language, but it, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's him. We're going to be with him. And whatever part of your body hurts right now won't ever hurt again. And whatever worries you've got, they'll all be gone. One minute. One minute after you leave this earth. None of this is going to matter. This building, the air conditioning, my Sunday school classroom would not get cool this morning. I have no idea what the problem was. But when we get to heaven, we're not going to walk around saying, my Sunday school class never got cool. <laughs> we aren't going to care. Those churches that gathered a few hours ago, 12 hours ago in the Philippines, with no walls, and just a thatched roof do you think it will matter to them where they went to church I'll tell you this the little lady who opened her Bible in front of a group of Sunday school children and taught them the word of God in Nigeria out in the sun that lady will be glad she had a Bible and taught the Sunday school lesson to the little kids in Nigeria. She will not care that there were flies in the classroom. She won't care that a rhinoceros ran by during class. <laughs> and I'll tell you what else. One minute in hell and Bill Gates will hate his money. He'll hate every computer He'll hate Facebook and Instagram and the whole thing. One minute in hell. And the only thing that will matter is how you wish you had trusted Christ. And one minute in heaven, ah, it doesn't matter. One leg shorter than the other, it doesn't matter. God's got a new leg for you. Oh, my eyes are crossed. He's got eyes, all kinds of eyes up there for you. They'll... They, Well, I never married. Oh, he's espoused you as a chaste bride to the son of God. You're not going to care. They never had children. Oh, you won't care. Do you have, do you have, you'll care if you had spiritual children. Say, I never, never had much of an education. You were smart enough to trust Jesus. Look, I'll tell you, one minute, one minute, and everything changes. Let's pray. Help us today, Father, to realize how sudden and how eternal life can change. One minute after leaving this world, everything will change. And it might be, as we have many times, we'll have a funeral. And some dear friend will be before us in a casket. And we'll remember stories and share memories. But the big thing is where they went when they left. And the big thing for the Christian is, did they live for you, Father? So I pray today for the Christians, those who know for sure they've been saved, they've trusted Christ. I pray you'd help us to love this Bible and to love your people and to do all we know how to help the cause of Christ. But if someone here today in the building or maybe someone listening online doesn't know for sure they're saved, I pray you'd help them today to trust Christ. This is forever. And one minute off this planet, they won't care how old they were, or what color hair they had. They won't care about fingernails or cell phones or cars. They'll only care about whether they trusted Christ or not. Now help us, I pray. I pray you'd speak to hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together for a moment with our heads back.